confess those sins, they are thrown into the sea of God's forgetfulness. He does not remember them. Yeah, that was a good, that was a good message, Jen. Thank you. I'm always amazed to hear in an air crash that the victims are so badly mutilated that they have to be identified by dental records. Well, if they don't know who you are, how do they know who your dentist is? <laughs> Matthew 11, uh, 28 to 30 says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I think it says in the King James, labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for this opportunity to bring these morsels of your word to the family in the house today. And I pray, Lord, with your anointing and your power that these words go right to where you want them to go and that they will have the effect that you want them to have. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the book of Acts, we have Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus in chapter 9. Then in chapter 11, a revival broke out in Antioch, which is the city where people were first called Christian. And um, in Acts 11, 21 to 22, it says, The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. They sent Barnabas. Now Barnabas must have had some stature in the Jerusalem church. They sent him to see what was going on down there and to have some influence over what kind of doctrine was being presented there. They wanted to make sure that the new believers weren't being led astray uh, as the devil would have it. And the Jerusalem church wanted to make sure that the fest, that, um, that the revival was based on sound doctrine. So they sent Barney, Barnabas down there. This is interesting that, you know, in, in Barnabas wasn't, um, I think he was from Cilicia. Anyway, he, he, wa he wasn't a native of Jerusalem. He came there from somewhere else. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, when the Spirit fell, Peter was emboldened to go out and preach. And 3,000 people got saved. And more were added every day. And there were until, there were, I think, 5,000 people in there. And, and when the power of God fell and people started speaking in other tongues, there were people there from all over. They were all Jews and they could speak um, Hebrew or Aramaic, but they also spoke their native language where they came from. And so I'm thinking that I'm thinking Barnabas was one of those that was converted in that time because he wasn't from there. Doesn't that make sense? I th I'm thinking he was that he that he was converted along with all those other people that heard the tongue talkers, and um, I'm thinking that that was. And then he uh, attached to the Jerusalem church, uh, had some stature, and they sent him to see what was going on down here in Antioch. So in Acts 11, 25 to 26, this is then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So that is how Paul and Barnabas came to be a ministry team. You know, when uh, Stephen was martyred, he was the first martyr, that scattered the Christians uh, 
all over to different nations and they started sharing the word wherever they went and that's how these revivals popped up that's how this Antioch revival popped up and then in Acts chapter 13 2 to 3 it says while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting the Holy Spirit said set apart for me Barnabas and Saul remember they're in Antioch at this point to work to the uh, for the work which I have called them so after they had fasted and prayed they placed their hands on them and sent them off so they were commissioned to go on a mission so Saul also known as Paul and Barnabas and Barnabas um, I think his name was actually James anyway um, they went from place to place preaching the good news about Jesus sharing the gospel in each town they faced opposition as Christians always do because we are in the devil's territory on this earth and he doesn't want us to succeed and there's always opposition he inspires people to go against the believers uh, but anyway um, we pick it up in Acts chapter 14 starting with verse number 8 in Lystra Lystra was one of the towns they went to there sat a man who was lame he had been that way from birth and had never walked now we don't know who the, what the man's name was but we do know what his condition was he was unable to walk he was lame I think in the King James they, they they said it was crippled he couldn't move about on his own power in those days a condition like that uh, would render you to be a beggar you couldn't farm you couldn't tend grapevines you couldn't work a field you couldn't um, manage a, a herd of sheep you couldn't be a carpenter unless you were born into a well-off family you would be destitute life would be bleak nothing to look forward to no woman would marry you you would never have children this man was crippled from birth getting from place to place would require assistance his very life uh, would require the well wishes of kind people so he listened to Paul in verse 9 as he was speaking he listened he was in this crowd of people and it says Saul began to be called Peter in the previous chapter but he listened to Paul now he's called Paul and the lame man was paying very close attention to Paul's words to what Paul was saying Paul always preached the gospel and if he was talking to a place for a lot of Jewish people then he used uh, scriptures from the Old Testament but we don't have the text of Paul's sermon but he preached the gospel he had lovely feet <laughs> because he carried the good news that the Savior had come it says in, a, in one of the Psalms how lovely on the mountains are the feet of them who bring good news so everywhere he went he carried the good news that faith in Jesus would gain eternal life he preached it to the Jews and to the Gentiles he preached it to the Greeks and the Roman pagans he was in the territory of the pagans he was certainly in the devil's territory you know there's a rising of paganism in this country sheer just rejection of God so there was a change happening in this lame man's soul an intense internal change he was riveted he was listening very intently to the word the word is powerful it doesn't return void Paul preached the word and this man was riveted and there was an internal change taking place a moving from no faith to faith in Jesus that was happening in his heart in his soul as he listened to the words that Paul spoke and continuing in verse 9 it says Paul looked directly at him 
and he saw that he had faith to be healed. Now, Paul was speaking to a crowd. He drew crowds wherever he went. Sometimes they became hostile. Sometimes they were cooperative. But it was a crowd of people, a lot of people. But the Holy Spirit focused Paul's attention on this one face, this one man. And he could see that a change was happening in him. Paul could see it. Did you ever see faith? You can't really see it. You can see what it does. You can see what it produces. But you can't actually see faith. But Paul could see faith. He could see it. sinner Paul the one who destroy, tried to destroy the church the man who was blinded on the road to Damascus and couldn't see anything now he has this seeing that he can look at a person's face and he could see something happening he could see into someone's spirit God removed the scales from his eyes on the road to Damas on after he went into Damascus. But, but now he could actually see that this man had faith. He can see into the spirit of this lame man. He could see faith welling up in him. But you can't, you can see what faith does, but you can't actually see faith itself. But Paul could see it. He could see that he had faith to be healed. And in verse 10, and he called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. Paul had authority. Get up on your feet. And he got up. We don't know what else happened to that man. But I must think that if he had faith to be healed, that he also had faith to believe and that he was also saved. That's an assumption on my part. But if he had faith to be healed, he would also have faith to be saved. And the effect of this healing was that the citizens thought that Paul and Barnabas were gods. And they were going to worship them. They tried actually to worship them. And Paul and Barnabas had great difficulty in convincing them that they were just humans. They were not gods. They had a hard time convincing them that. But they thought because of this miracle that they were gods. But the change that Paul was able to see. I have seen this change myself. I have seen it. Usually it's in someone I've never seen before. But during a sermon, sometimes I can tell that that person is going to respond. I remember a children's program we had in at our home church. And my part of it was to just bring the altar call. The children had a, had a drama program, long costumes, and they had the whole thing here. And I, I was assigned to make an altar call. And one of, the, one of the parents of the children was sitting in the second row, right on the aisle, right about there. And as I spoke, I could see a change coming over his face. I could see it. And I knew that the gospel, as it was presented by the kids, and now reaffirmed, re reinforced by me, was penetrating. And he came to the altar and got saved. I could see the change on his face. We went down to Shade Gap. I preached down there just once, huh? Or we preached down there twice. Twice. Shade Gap. I don't know if you remember Shade Gap. That was where a guy, they called him the mountain man. He captured a girl on a school bus. Do you remember that? And he dragged her into the woods and everything. And they finally shot that guy. Well, anyway, there's a church right there at Shade Gap. And I was asked to go down there and preach. And there was a... Uh, there was a young man there, and he was very sullen. Dark look on his face, and even even his complexion was darkish, and it wasn't summertime. And there was something like a broodingness about him. And you know, I kept 
and I on him. <laughs> And when I invited people to come down for prayer, he came down and sat on the front seat. He just threw himself down, his arm folded like this. And there was a young woman standing behind him. It, that was either his wife or girlfriend, I'm not sure which. And another lady beside him. And it turned out that was his mother. And another lady on the other side. He was surrounded. He couldn't get in. He couldn't go anywhere. Another, the other lady was his aunt, found out later. And I walked over to him and I said, you need prayer. And his mother said, oh, does he ever. But I knew there was something happening. I said, you're not right with God, are you? He said, no. I said, but you want to be, don't you? He said, yes. And he got saved. I led him to the Lord. It was, the, it was the most awesome part of that service, you know, the part that you always remember, those victories. And it turned out later on, his, his former pastor was Pastor Wayne, my, my pastor's dad. And I, we told him about that, and he said, you know, he grew up in the church, but just never capitulated, never gave in to God, never. That was a healing. That was a miracle. But I could see it on his face. The lame man in Leicester had two problems. He couldn't walk, and he was a sinner. This being a sinner is a bigger problem because it's eternal. He was lame from birth, never walked. We are all lame from birth in a sin way from birth. We are lame. We're not able to walk with God when we're sinners. When we're lame in our sins. Oh, we get a, a reprieve until the age of accountability, but because of our sin, we deserve the flames of perdition. A miracle was needed. We all need a miracle. It's a miracle from God when someone believes, turns from unbelief to faith. That's a miracle. It's the greatest miracle that can happen. The sickness of sin is eternal. But it's not incurable. <laughs> the cure is Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he's the only hope to be relieved from that sickness of sin. Paul brought the word to heal him. Psalm 107, 20 says, He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. It's, it speaks of healing and it speaks of being rescued from the grave. That's God's word. That's what it does. The power in the word of God heals the body and heals the sinful soul. God's power brings you from the darkness of sin into the glorious light of salvation. And that light is manifest through the word. Paul and Barnabas labored. We're talking about labor today. This is Labor Day, so we're talking about labor. Carrying the gospel is labor. Satan doesn't want to give up one soul. The more believers labor, the more damage they, I should say we, do to Satan's kingdom, the harder he works to stop us. Carrying the gospel is an uphill battle. It's wearying. It's fatiguing. Sometimes it's even discouraging. Barnabas' real name was Joseph. That was his real name. Barnabas means man of encouragement. So they must have given him that name in the Jerusalem church before they sent him down there. But Paul must have needed encouragement. Barnabas was known as an encourager. God put them together in ministry, partnership, 
We all need to encourage each other. We all need to do that. 2 Timothy 1.9 He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Called. If you're saved, you're called. It's a calling to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Some have a lifelong calling. Pastors, teachers, evangelists, apostles, prophets. But we all have a calling. All believers do. Because we have the truth. We carry it. We've experienced it. That leads to eternal life. If you have a jug of water and you come across someone that's dying of thirst, would you ignore them or give them a drink? People that you know are dying of thirst for salvation. They're lost in their sins. They're bound for the flames of hell. But we as believers, we're all called to share a drink of our faith, a libation of the gospel. The calling is in all of us. Not only on the pastors and teachers, but, I mean, we can ignore it. We have a mission field. We have neighbors, co-workers, even those in our own family who don't have faith, who haven't come to Christ. Sometimes there's a momentary calling. Someone you see, God says, talk to that person. He speaks that into your spirit, the still small voice. That's a calling. Just do it. <laughs> it's easy to turn away from that. I have many times, but just do it. I've only had two people that I approached that were strangers in a store that said, no, go pray for somebody else. Two people, only two. So we're called, we're sent, Romans 10, 14 and 15. How then can they call on the one they have not, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We are called, we are sent, but there's labor involved. Paul and Barnabas were appointed as directed by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit spoke to the people in the Antioch church, set them aside and send them off. They were called, directed by the Holy Spirit to do work for God. It wasn't easy. They were sent off by the church. God knew that this healing would happen. God knew about everything that would happen in ministry. They labored. Paul and Barnabas, they labored in it. They worked hard. They had opposition. Carrying the gospel is vital to those who hear and turn to God. There's a war on. We face a lot of battles. The war has been won in you and in me. But every time we, or you, win a soul, we win a battle in that person. We don't fight the battles alone. The Holy Spirit comes alongside of us. We work in partnership with the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit was active. Paul was directed by the Holy Spirit to see that the lame man had faith. The Holy Spirit was at work in the lame man also. God directs and God sets things up. People have free will. You know, they can turn a cold shoulder to God. I did that. I was a young man. I didn't want anything to do with him. It's sad. But our God is a God of second choices. Second chances, I should say. They faced opposition, and so do we. The 
citizens were trying to worship Paul and Barnabas. They thought they were gods because of this healing that had taken place in the lame man. And then in verse 19 and 20, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. <laughs> the crowd was going to worship him. These Jews came and turned them against Paul and they stoned him. But the disciples gathered around him. He got up and went back into the city. The next day he and Barnabas left for Derby. They thought he was dead. When you get stoned, they don't stop stoning you until you are dead. I think he was dead. And God raised him. And he went back into the city. Went right back in there. The next day they left. But I'm sure that he was dead. And Paul had he said, he said, I know a man, whether, I forget how that scripture goes, but he was caught up to the third heaven. I'm sure that was him. And he talked about things that are inexpressible. But he wasn't done. Went back into the city. Acts 14, 22, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Hardships. You know, if you think because you're born again and you're going to church and everything that you don't have any hardships, well, then you're not doing something for God. Because as soon as you do, you're going to have an enemy coming after you. And he does. They stoned Paul. They stoned him. That wasn't all he did to him. He had all kinds of physical. And then in, in the end, they chopped his head off. And all the, all the original apostles were martyred except for John. It's interesting. Hardship, labor. Why do you want to go through all that? Why don't we just get saved, live a good life, and go to heaven in the end? Because you can't bring anybody with you, and that's what you're supposed to do. The Great Commission falls on all of us. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. We have work to do. We're the ones that have the truth. We're the ones that have the gospel. There's work to do. But he said, I'm with you. I'm with you. So we labor. It's a labor. It's an uphill battle. We can just turn our back on it. Or we can put our shoulder to it and do it. <laughs> if you want to accomplish something, you want to build a house, you want to... You, there's, there's always effort in whatever you do. Jen has to drive how many miles on Interstate 80 every day? How many? 40 some miles on Interstate 80. One way, right? Because she, she has a job in Brookville. So she labors. It's hard. It's not easy, is it? Wait till winter comes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wait till winter comes. She, it's a labor. And not only that, but when she gets there, then she has work to do. Labor. How many pounds to the quarters that weigh that you that you cut up? Put them on your shoulder, take them over the table, cut them up, right? Quarter of beef, how much does that weigh? It was labor, and you did it eight hours a day. And these people at the turn of the century did it for 12 hours a day. Labor. But carrying the gospel is the most important work that we can do. Most important. 
because people's eternity God, God expects us to do that to carry the gospel but he's with us in it we partner with the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit pulls the veil down that's what happened that's what Paul was seeing when he saw in, on this man's face this faith he could see that he had faith what he was seeing was the Holy Spirit at work in the guy. Paul shared the word. The Holy Spirit came at him from the other end, pulled the veil down, and, and the guy got healed. And I believe he got saved too. How could you get healed like that without getting saved, without knowing where that healing came from? It's powerful. So we have, I mean, we have, we have work to do. It isn't going to happen just all by itself. We have, we have a prayer meeting on Wednesday. And um, I'm not, the, we're doing that instead of a Bible study right now. We sit there and we pray. We take turns praying. We don't have an order. You're next, you're next, and you don't have to say a thing. You don't have to, you don't have to say anything out loud. You can agree with the person that's praying. You can agree out loud or quiet. There's no rules on that, but I think it's going to produce results. And Jan suggested to me that we should also fast. And if you're coming to the prayer meeting and you want to fast, that's up to you. That's up to you. If you want to fast that day or just that afternoon, and that's up to you. Fasting is a, is a private thing. But we're going to keep praying. I think, um, Boyd, I think we prayed you in here. <laughs> I believe it. I think we prayed you in here. And we're going to pray some more in here, too. Yeah. God is good. Life is hard. There's an uphill battle. There's a labor. Especially if you're sharing the gospel. It's a labor. But... It produces results, sometimes not as fast as we think it should, sometimes in a different way than we think it should, because God is sovereign. But we win. Read the end of the book. <laughs> Read the end of the book. We win. Amen. Do you want to be a winner? I want to be a soul winner. I haven't led anybody to the Lord for a while been a little while there's going to be a wedding and um, it's a the guy is I think Teresa's ex's nephew or something like that and the lady I met with them one time and I led her to the Lord just in that meeting talking about a wedding and they're going to get married on the 25th up in Black Machan and, and we're meeting with them on Thursday to finalize the the results but I take every opportunity and then, you know that just isn't me if you're a believer you share the gospel it happened to you somebody shared the gospel and you got saved so let's take that to heart this morning right right all right would you stand I'm done talking now would you stand Lord, I believe this commission is on all of us. It wasn't just on Paul and Barnabas. It wasn't just on the believers in Jerusalem. It wasn't just on the church at Antioch. It wasn't. It wasn't just on any. It isn't just on a church or an organization. It's individual on each one of us because we have the truth, and we're not to keep it to ourselves. We're not to keep it to ourselves. We're to share it, Lord. And I believe that as I have shared these words with these believers, that we will do that, Lord. But it's an uphill battle. It's a labor. And we just ask that it would be obvious that you're with us, Lord, when we're sharing the gospel with somebody, that it's your will and it's your work. We're just the servants. We're just the ones who carry it. But the Holy Spirit, Lord, will actually do the work internally. But we will, Lord. I pray for just a, just a new determination in us, Lord, to bring people. To bring 
bring people to the cross, to bring people, to get people saved, and then bring them in, and then bring them here. We will love them. Thank you, Lord, for this service, for these believers, for the message. We pray that it'll have a powerful influence. And we ask you to bless us as we go our way until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.